Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys uh, this morning. And uh, today's topic is one that I think should touch upon people of all ages, age groups. And the reason I say that is because um, today's topic is called For Rags or Riches, right? And I'm going to read for us a passage in Proverbs, okay? Proverbs chapter 30. And for those of you who may not know uh, what Proverbs is, Proverbs is the book, a book of wisdom, okay? And a lot of these books of wisdom, they give wisdom or godly wisdom in the form of poems or sayings, right? <coughs> and in these poems and sayings, however, there's always the allusion to what God is trying to tell us about these things, all right? So we're going to read Proverbs chapter 30, and we're going to read verse 7 to verse 9. So Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 to 9. <coughs> and I apologize ahead of time so that you guys are more comfortable. I have a dry cough um, after I got COVID earlier uh, late in September. I've tested negative till now, but unfortunately, I think I might have a little bit of long, more long-term issues with, uh, with my lungs. So just so that everybody knows, I've tested negative vaccinated, everything's good. <laughs> so Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 to 9. Okay, let's read the word of God. Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So let me pray for us. <coughs> Dear God, we want to thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word, God. May you give us, Lord God, a heart that is open to your spirit, Lord, and a mind that is willing to absorb the knowledge that is in your word. God, we pray, Lord, that your word would not just be theoretical, Lord God, that it would be applicable to our each and every single day lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this chance to gather together in this church here on the Sunday, Lord God, so that we can hear more about you, Lord God. May you speak through your word. And we thank you, Lord God, for the worship uh, and for the brothers and sisters here. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, what's interesting is right now, something recently just happened, right? Elon Musk bought what? Twitter. And Twitter is one of the first and foremost social media platforms. Amongst that, you've got Snapchat, you've got Instagram. You used to have Facebook, but Facebook is now meta, and nobody really uses Facebook that much anymore. And there's so many things that I have here on my phone, just apps alone, that deal with social media, right? And I can get information all the time about all sorts of people, day in and day out. I mean, if you really wanted to, right? <coughs> For those who have, uh, who have kids, Take a look and look at your phone, because I know iPhone and some uh, Android track this. How long do they spend on these apps, right? I'm not saying that to get you guys in trouble, by the way. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm getting to a point. What's happening is that there's so much information that comes in, and we see the lives of other people. And of course, in our minds, we know this is the curated life of somebody else, right? I see my friend, oh, just bought a new house. Here's our keys. Husband, wife, kids look beautiful. Their dog looks cute. Then they go in and say, oh, here's my new car. Here's this, here's that. We're eating at this place. Look how amazing this food is. And of course, you know, like, while well, my wife takes picture of food, I'm standing there like, I'm so hungry. Why do, why do you have to take 10 pictures? I just want to eat, right? And so we see curated lives from everyone, right? Curated. And curated means they're not going to pick out when they look terrible. They pick out when they look the best, right? when they look the absolute best. And so you get these things, and there's something that I noticed, <coughs> for me personally, I think for a lot of other people, is that in light of seeing all these things, it drives you a little bit to want just a little bit more, right? In the past, had I not known that, you know, somebody's kids had, a, I'll tell you a funny story, right? Uh, and this is just a little bit of confession on my part. So uh, Ellie, my oldest daughter, just turned four. She turned four last Thursday. And what happened was that we know that, uh, that when kids turn four and they're in daycare or whatever it is, or, or preschool, like you have to get gift bags or goodie bags for everybody in the class. 
So parents, you know this, like you scramble the night before, you're like, what can we put in here? We didn't have enough you know, gummy bears, so we had to go find gummies like in all of our cabinets and put it in. <coughs> but the problem is this. One of the other kids in the class had a birthday just a month ago. And when Ellie came home, she was so excited because she had this little bag. And in this little bag, I was like, oh, what did you get? She was like, oh, it was so-and-so's birthday. I said, oh, really? That's cool, right? I'm expecting, you know, you take it out, you have like a pen, a pad, maybe some stickers, something small, right? And she pulls out Lego glasses. I was like, what? Because I love Legos, by the way, guys. I love Legos. And she pulls out these glasses that have Lego, the ability to put Lego on it, and you could like build on a pair of like these plastic frame glasses. And it was like really cool. <clears throat> and I looked at that, I was like, oh, that must have been expensive. That's such a cool gift. Now what happened when now I have to prepare Ellie's gift? I sat there, at first I was like, my, my wife and I were like, oh, we could just, you know, let's just get whatever. Like it's, it, we just have to do it because it's her birthday, right? Then all of a sudden I thought about that one person's gift. I was like, uh-oh. Like now we have to keep up with the Jones, right? Like if they brought such a good gift, ours has to be just as good, if not better. And so then if, because I saw that gift, now I'm looking at mine, I'm like, nope, I'm sorry, Lucy, I will order it. Don't worry about it, I got it. So I went online, I looked for Pokemon like keychains, I looked for Pokemon <laughs> bracelets, I looked for Pokemon stickers and all the cool ones, I looked for packs of Pokemon cards. I, I went all out and I bought these things, I put them in the boxes, and not only did they get a little bag that's disposable, we got <coughs> Pokemon face boxes that you had to like put together to give to people. And I was so proud when Ellie takes this box, we brought her to school and I took this box in. All the kids are like, wow, this is amazing. And then I felt good, right? I was like, ah, now my gift bag for my daughter is better than that other kid's gift bag. And it's better than all the ones from the previous year. And I felt good. But let's think about it. Would I have spent too much money on a kid's gift bag that they're going to lose in one day, they're going to play with it, and then they're going to just, I don't know where it is, if I had not compared and seen the gift back from the other kid. And why is it that as a parent, even if you think as a Christian, did I find the need to be just better than this other one? I just had to be a little bit better. Now, that's a, that's a cute story, right? But this happens day in and day out. And one of the things that we're talking about today is the idea of being content. Because in this day and age where we see so many other people's perfect curated lives, we find ourselves lacking. And that lacking actually brings about a lot of stress, anxiety, and brings about, you know what, am I good enough? What's going on? Do I need to do better? Should I be spending this money? I should be far ahead. They do not work as hard as me. So why is it that they succeed and I do not? And then inside of that struggle for us as human beings, even though we're, we say we're Christians and we want to only rely on God, there's so many times that we get to this point where we say, hey, I'm not content with what I have. I'm not content. You see, Proverbs deals with this, right? Proverbs says this, two things I ask you, deny them not from me before I die. So these are very important, right? Literally what the, the, the writer is saying is that, hey, there's just two wishes that I had. Like if I had a genie, I would make these two wishes. Before I die, do this for me. <clears throat> Remove from me falsehood and lying. That's the first one. Remove from me falsehood and lying. I'll explain why we go through that. And it give me neither poverty nor riches. And in conjunction with that, feed me with the food that is needful to me. Now, why um, falsehood and lying? I think that the removal of falsehood and lying, and we'll get into the second part, which is the main point, but removal of falsehood and lying means this. It means that make everything apparent to me as it is. Because there's so many times that we can lie to ourselves, right? We say, well, I'm doing this for the good of my daughter, right? I am I, I did this because, you know, Ellie, I would like Ellie to feel proud at school that she has a good, good gift bag. I can make all sorts of excuses, and I can lie to myself and say, oh, I did this for a good reason. 
But at the end of the day, if I was to examine myself without falsehood and lying, I know that I did it for my own pride. Ellie would have been just as happy if we sent her with a pen and a pad for each of the kids, right? She would have been, this is so cool. I can give all my friends something because she's four. She didn't have a comparison, right? She's too young to understand that. And so remove from me falsehood and lying so that I may not fool others and I may not fool myself into thinking that I need something that I don't. Because the second part says this, give me neither poverty nor riches, but rather feed me with the food that is needful for me. The reason why is in the next verse. It says, let's not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? And let's not be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Now, it's, it's pretty simple to understand this when you read it at face value, right? It says this, God, do not let me be either poor or too rich. <coughs> because if I'm, <coughs> excuse me, if I'm too rich, what will happen is that I will rely on myself and say, Who's God? I can afford to do everything myself. This is what a lot of us fall into, right? I'll give you an example, right? In, in, um, in a lot of situations when you have churches that are like upper, upper middle class um, and you want to run an event, right? You want to do something. Then what happens is that you go through, you say, okay, well, well, what can we do? And then what happens is that people are always like, oh, I'll just pay for it. Don't worry about it. Let's go. Let's do it. I've got the capability. I will do it. Not to say that's bad, by the way. But the mentality is that very rarely does prayer, is prayer actually necessary for the things we do, right? Because we have the ability. Uh, I heard a story about someone who is a, um, a, trying to do mission work in another country. And so what they did was, the story is that they went to a uh, seminary in this one, I forget where it was, right? And in that seminary were a bunch of uh, international uh, future pastors, right? People who are studying for the MDiv, trying to be pastors in their own communities, in other countries. And all these people came to this one seminary. <clears throat> and this person, uh, one of the also fellow seminarians, uh, went there and he said, okay, well, let me try to get to know some of these people from other countries. And he goes and he realizes something. <clears throat> he realizes that when he goes to early morning prayer meetings, he does not see Americans. He does not see Europeans. He sees only people who are from these poor nations. And now he wonders, though. He's like, okay, I, I don't know what's going on, right? So let me attend. When the prayer meeting begins from the early stages of the semester, a lot of people sign up, right? Everybody wants to be holy. You're in seminary. Like, prayer meeting's the, the lowest bar that you can set, right? So everybody's like, Okay, I'll get up at 5 a.m. We'll go to 5.30, 6 a.m. prayer meeting, and we pray for an hour, and then, and then we go to our classes and do what we want. All of a sudden, first exam rolls around. Second exam rolls around. And that number of people at the prayer meeting just diminishes. Less and less people. So finally, there's just a small group of people. And this seminary, and this first seminary that I was talking about, went there, and he struggled hard. He's like, I need to go, right? I want to connect with my fellow brothers and sisters that are from these other nations. So if they go, I have to go. And he goes, and it just gets harder and harder and harder. And then one day, he's talking to one of the other seminarians who's from this other nation. Um, and he's like, hey, I'm really having a tough time coming to these early morning, right? We got exams, we got finals. How do you do it? How do you do it? And the seminary tells him, oh, that's easy. You guys, have it too easy. You want food, you go to your refrigerator. If you don't have food in your refrigerator, you get in your car and you just go to the store. You want to go to a hospital, you hop in a taxi, you can call 911, anything, you go, right? Everything is easy for you. Now for where I'm from, if you get sick and the bus only comes around once a week, you have two options. You pray or you just sit there and hope that you don't die. And so the only thing we can rely on, the reason why we are able to come here and pray, is because we had no other option. And so therefore, we must rely on God. You see, wealth and poverty is actually a really interesting um, concept, especially for us in America. Because many times, like, uh, our perception, even over time, even if we're from poor countries, our perception of what is wealthy, how much we have, 
gets twisted very quickly. Right? The reason why is because everything's so easy here. And so therefore, we do not have to really rely on God. And that's why prayer is so difficult. Only when a congregation that I've seen in this congregation, any congregation, is when there's no amount of money that can solve a problem, no amount of thinking and planning that can fix an issue, all of a sudden, prayer becomes very important because you have that earnest desire, right? And when we look at Proverbs for the first part, when it's talking about uh, give me neither poverty or riches, feed me with the food that's needful to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? If we really think about our own lives when we're talking about poverty or riches, we are very, very rich where we are. Doesn't matter if we think we are in middle class or lower class, right, in America, we are more well off than many times we assume. And because of that, we as a people have grown to the point where we say, hey, we don't need to think about God, right? We don't need to pray about it. What I need to do is work harder and make more money. That's kind of my solution, my way, right? Oh no, like <coughs> Ellie needs to go to school. She needs to go to daycare. Well, guess I gotta put in the extra hours. Is there a side gig that I could do? Maybe I should open a boba tea shop and make extra money. Like, who knows? Maybe I should invest in some property and you'll make extra money so we can send her to a better school. All that stuff comes up because why? Because we think that we're able, and so therefore, prayer is not needed. Prayer is for, you know, when someone's sick, when, you know, other people have problems, right? Oh, I can't physically help this person like who is suffering with something, so you know what, thoughts and prayers. Let me pray for you. It's our easy way out. We say, when we pray, we say, God, they're having problems. You're the almighty God, go help them, right? It's easy for us to do that. But when this talks about, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? It is not a open mouth like, God, I don't need you anymore. We'll never say that, we're Christians. We come to church on Sundays, we sit here and we, you know, we sing and we worship, we have fun, and we'll never outwardly say that. But many times our lives, if you really think about it, denies the existence of the Lord because we do not have to rely on him like we should. And that's tough sometimes, especially for someone like me, right? Because I've got a decent job right now, right? Who knows what happens when recession hits or whatever, but right now, it paid me plenty to do some IT work for a law firm. I work for a law firm by working IT. It's comfortable, right? I may have to attend meetings sometimes. I may have to you know, get mad that I have too many meetings. But if you, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a bad deal. You pay me money to go to meetings, better than paying me money to do something else, right, that I really hate. It's not a problem. But still, I become discontent. And then my prayers to God is like, God, well, you find me a new job. I really don't like where I am. God's like, oh, buddy. This is a blessing. I don't know what you're talking about. You're not going to get paid much more to do much less anywhere else. I've already given you something good, right? <coughs> you're getting paid the same thing that you did five years ago, but you got more money doing it. Like, I thought this was a blessing for you, but hey, if you want to complain, you let me know, right? And so sometimes we sit there and we deny the Lord with our lives and we say things like, okay, well, now that God has given me this and I have plenty, I will do it on my own. I don't really need God. God, don't worry. Right? I'm grown up. I'm out of the house. You know, 21, I've moved out. I've gotten married. I have a spouse. God, you just relax. Stay at church and then let me do my thing because I'm okay. And that's how we live our lives. That is when we have so much that we deny the Lord. And so when we thought, think about, however, contentment from this perspective, we can definitely say that someone who is wealthy does not necessarily, it does not necessarily mean that they are also content. You can have a lot of money and still be discontent as to where you are. I mean, one of the things that uh, recently, right, the Powerball, the Mega Millions, like $700 million. $700 million, almost a billion dollars right now. Imagine if you won that, right? But then I started, like, I was curious, so, Whenever you look at these like headlines and you click on Google, Google knows, and then Google starts sending you a bunch of articles for all this other advertisement stuff, right? <coughs> I 
So after I, after I clicked that, I was like, what? 700 million? This is interesting. Let me read it. And then they're doing analysis like, oh, the most chance of these numbers, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, that's interesting statistics, kind of fun. And all of a sudden, the next articles are all about the people who have one millions and immediately lost it. Like, one hundred million dollars, destitute after five years. And I'm thinking to myself, how is that possible? Like, that feels like more money than I can use in an entire life. And I started reading about what they spent. I was like, oh, well, first they went out and bought a $75 million yacht. Then they didn't realize that yearly, in order to keep that yacht at the marina, they had to pay a million dollars. I was like, oh, that's not a good idea. And boom, boom, boom. And you realize that people can come into a lot of money, so much so that they, can, they don't know what to do with themselves. Then all of a sudden, they're discontent. Perfectly content before, making you know, even minimum wage, being happy with the family. And all of a sudden, as soon as they get married, I mean, as soon as they win the millions, all of a sudden that marriage is over. I read a couple of those as well. Uh, you know, a woman allowed, this, uh, uh, allowed her partner to live with her for, for like no rent because he was trying to do his best. The moment they hit the lotto, immediately separated, went on their own ways. So when we think about <coughs> whether or not wealth gives us content, like gives us the ability to be content, the answer is really no. I mean, it, it, I, right now, if I think about it, right, when I was coming out of college and getting my first job, I got, I was originally working for an eye doctor, right? And for that day and age, like, uh, like in uh, uh, college, a little after college, he was paying me something like $17 an hour, $17 an hour. And it was really good compared to everybody else. Everybody else was like trying to make their money, like working at McDonald's or at like, you know, a store or retail. And it was kind of like, oh man, you make 17, what do you do? Well, I sit in the front and when the kid comes in, I'm like, I take your information, your health ins healthcare insurance information. Then I go and I'm like, can you read this letter? Can you read this letter? Can you read this letter? Oh, you can't? Okay. And I give it to the doctor and the doctor goes in, right? And it's not too bad and getting paid that was pretty good. But then if I think about what I make now, why do I feel like I'm so much poorer now, right? Because all of a sudden you get older, right? And you realize something called debt that you can use. And so you leverage, right? Oh, okay, now I can buy a bigger house. And all of a sudden you realize, man, if I lost my job right now, I can't pay my mortgage. Shoot, but you've, you're, you're actually a lot more wealthy. I, was a lot, I am a lot more wealthy than I was before. But yet the stress has piled up and increased. And there are studies that say that people who make something around between half a million to like two million, if you ask them, do you believe that you are wealthy? They will tell you absolutely not. And you sit there and we laugh, right? But the honest opinion is I think that if we all ended up in that area, you might be in that area now, I don't know. But if we all ended up in that stratosphere, we will also sit there and be like, oh, no, 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 no. There's a lot of debt incurred. I have so much stuff I need to pay for. Like, if I don't have this anymore, I'm game over, right? It, we will be in that same place. We laugh about it until we get there. And when we get there, we, we think to ourselves like, oh no, I don't have enough. And so therefore, when you look at this, wealth does not mean that you will be content, right? Wealth, what it does to you, when you're so rich, what it does is that you begin to deny God in two ways. Number one, God, you need to give me more. Or God, I don't need you anymore. Those are the two ways. Now it says, give me neither poverty nor riches, because the second half of this, <coughs> excuse me, the second half are this. It says, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. You see, it takes a certain amount of pressure, and poverty is actually a very big problem. Right? I'm, not, I, I'm telling you, poverty is a huge issue. We may not be impoverished, but for those who have struggles from poverty to where they are now, poverty is a very big issue. And the reason why is this, is because as Christians, we know that we are held to uh, the standard that God has set in terms of holiness and righteousness. But if you are so impoverished that let's pretend for a moment that you cannot feed your children, man, for, for Albert, you see Albert speaking here time and time again, I will tell you right now as full confession, if I was not able to feed my daughters, I have no qualms about stealing food to feed them. Like, it, let's just be honest here. Like, this is Albert saying, telling you guys, this is what's in my mind. If I could not, if I'm watching my daughter starve to death, 
I'm sorry. Like, I know holiness, righteousness demanded from God. But man, I love my daughters. So I'm going to commit that sin. Oops. God, maybe you understand. And does God understand that? Yes, he does. But the idea is that when we are so impoverished and we think that we must steal or do something, we do profane the name of our, our Heavenly Father. We try, right? But you get to a point, you say, God, this, this is not going to work out. I can't do it. And the same way someone who's wealthy forgets God, they also forget that God is able to provide. So therefore, they do what? They take it into their own hands. They say, I must do something. And so therefore, they do. And so when you read the verse, it says, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. It's saying that there are points that we believe ourselves to be so poor that we must commit some sort of act in order to be more content. Now I'm going to switch it on for you guys. <clears throat> Poverty and riches is actually very, very relative. Right? Very relative. Some people believe, some people who have, have a lot of money believe themselves to be very poor. Some people who are very poor believe themselves to be very wealthy. I will tell you that some of the richest people that I know are probably the stingiest people that I know. I'm like, buddy, you make more than everybody here combined. But when we go eat, right, hot pot, you're like, okay, well, you ordered. 450 and you ordered 550 and then so total $15 and then we also have to add tip so that you, you let me add tip and okay everybody you owe me $17.23 specifically $17.23 yeah, yeah yeah I calculated it I'm like, okay sure here's your $17.23 but I'm sitting there saying, thinking to myself buddy you make more than everybody combined just pick up the tab right you're a millionaire, go. Help us out here, we're poor, you're rich, help us out. <coughs> but then at the same time, I meet some people that are so, that are, I know are not as well off as me. And the first thing they do, doesn't matter, right? Not even for their own sake, they'll quietly pay for someone else's bill. I'm like, thinking to myself, like, do you have the money to do that? Like, is this a bad, like, bad budgeting on your part? But the reality is, if you knew them, you know that they are willing to do this for their friends and even for strangers. They can be poor, but they feel themselves, I have enough. But you can be very, very rich, monetarily rich, but you can say, well, I feel like I'm poor. So the idea of poverty and riches, especially when we look at this passage, deals with a mindset and understanding of your relationship directly to God. How, right? How? Because when you remove falsehood and lying and you're able to bear yourself before God and say, God, look at me for who I am. Do I understand my relationship with you? You realize that both someone who is monetarily or physically impoverished <coughs> or rich, they can both have a relationship with God that says, you know what? God, you are the only one for me. Let, 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 let's, let's play around with this idea a little bit. If I told you, right, let's say I told you that there was a pastor that I knew who is a multimillionaire, that the thought is immediately, what do you mean? Pastors can't have that much money. They can't love money. They, they, well, what do you mean? Like, he should be very poor. He should be making just enough to survive in order to keep up his holiness, right? That's kind of like where my heart is, where if I see somebody and Granted, let, let me take a step back. There are a lot of bad people who use religion and churches to make money. Recently, there was one guy um, who was robbed at the podium for, I think, something like $1.5 million worth of jewelry and watches. And then he complained, right? And he, the, the same guy who was a pastor of some church complained that, that his congregation, to his congregation, you do not trust God enough or else you would donate more so that I can get a private jet. Not just my, and there are people who are like that. I'm not talking about people who are like that, okay? I'm not talking about that. <clears throat> but you think about a pastor and you say, you immediately think, well, God doesn't use rich people, right? God only uses poor people. 
Because if you're rich, it means that you love money more than, and the answer is no. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all super wealthy. Job, super wealthy. If you look through scripture, it's not just these destitute, poor, like, you know, uh, prophets that like, you know, all they wear is like camel hair and they eat locusts and honey and they wander around the desert yelling things. God uses a lot of people. Centurion in the New Testament, right? The woman <coughs> who sells purple cloth, she's got a business and purple cloth is expensive. It's a high-end fashion thing. Purple's a tough color in ancient times to produce. And so you see here, but in, in our heads, in our mentality, we say, we assume that if you have this, and therefore you cannot be as holy as another? The answer is no, right? Now, let's, let's be very clear though. If you have more, do you have greater temptation to love money? The answer is also yes. Because if, let's say, let's talk about time, right? And this is a, a little bit of a tangent, but I want you guys just to understand this as a whole so you don't think that I'm telling you that someone who is you know, impoverished and spending all the time with God is not the right way to go, no. Because if you have limited amount of time, 24 hours in a day, what you spend time on is what you get back, right? So if you spend all your time making money, you will get money back. But if you are a pastor and you spend all your time, you know, looking after sheep, you're not making money. What you're doing is you're trying to reap souls for God. So therefore, there is a correlation between, okay, why are pastors usually so poor, right? It's because they spend all their time and energy trying to reach out to others, so they're not spending their time investing in the stock market or investing in homes and blah, blah, blah. So there is a little bit of correlation, okay? So I'm not saying that just because uh, that, that if a, a pastor has to be poor. I'm saying that in our own minds and hearts, do we measure holiness and righteousness based upon what someone else's income is? And why? Again, it goes back to contentment, right? How is it possible that this pastor that I know makes so much money, more money than me. He's a pastor. I'm struggling here. There's got to be something wrong. And we are discontent because we see curated lives of the other, right? Poverty and wealth many times is a mindset. But in both circumstances, they run into a problem, right? They have denied their Lord and Savior. You see, brothers and sisters, <coughs> When we talk about contentment, when we talk about poverty and wealth, I want you to be very clear that scripture is not setting a specific tax bracket that forces you to be under in order to be holy before God. Right? If God blesses you with a lot, man, that's awesome. We as a congregation, people, uh, as a global congregation, Christians should be happy if there is a wealthy Christian who's willing to spend his money for God. But at the same time, if you do not have as much as another, we should also be very joyful that God continues to use us in what we are. Because why? Because God doesn't guarantee us riches or poverty when we serve him. God guarantees us something far, far greater, and that is eternal life. You see, by measuring this world and our own brothers and sisters and people within the community, uh, within the Christian community and, our, and the church as a whole, according to worldly standards, man, that, that's a detriment. That is a detriment to each and every single one of us. Because that's what begins to drag people away. Drag us down when we compare. You see, brothers and sisters, one of the things that's kind of, kind of uh, interesting, right? And I'll put this in a non-money non term. Um, we, by nature, as, as human beings, even though we're Christians, have a tendency to do this. And, and it may not be money, right? Let's say that you're not jealous about money. But I can tell you for parents, big deal. What do I mean? If somebody walks into church, right? You've known this person for, 20, uh, for 15 years. And he tells you, my kid got into Stanford. And your kid is sitting there with a piece of paper from Rutgers. All of a sudden, you didn't think that you could be jealous. That jealousy wells up like, oh, they're always just talking about their kid and telling everybody because they want to be prideful. That, that's the natural inclination, right? Especially for, for Asian Americans because we're so based upon kind of like the merit base. It's so easy for us to immediately say, oh, well, that's ridiculous, right? They're just bragging about it. 
That's so unholy, right? Who cares where your kid went to college? <coughs> and we start to get a little, bit of a little bit of jealousy. And then on the other side, I've actually heard real life stories about this, where someone tells someone, hey, I know you're very proud of your daughter getting into this nice school or making this much money, but you probably don't have to tell us every week that this is going on. And then their response is what? You're just jealous. You're jealous of me. That's why you're bringing this up. And you're kind of like, no, what we are is bored of the same story, right? We were happy for you the first week and the second week, the first month and the second month, but by the time six months goes by, like, yeah, we've heard it, we know. Like, your daughter's, you know, went to NYU and made a bunch of money, and now she's a director or something. We get it. Like, like why are you telling us over and over and over? We know you're proud, right? And, you, and then they think that, they think that, oh, yeah, you're jealous of me. You see, it doesn't even have to do with just money. All of a sudden, the status of your kids or, like, you know, where something is, big deal. <coughs> and, and the funnier thing is that we get embarrassed if we come into success, right? If I drove in here, right, let's say, for example, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of into cars. I like cars because I think they're pretty cool. I like F1. F1's fun to watch for me. But if I drove into a church, imagine, in a Porsche GT3, forest green, right? Red brakes, right? Brembo brakes. And people see me, and I walk out of that car, I'm like, oh, I'm ready to speak. It, it, as much as we would love to say, oh, we're neutral in terms of, you know, judgment against another, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get judged very quickly, right? Instantaneously. Like, it'll just be like, boom. They, everyone looks out the window like, who is that? Albert walks out, you're like, uh-oh, maybe he's going off on the dark side. He's no longer a man of God. And this happens even and to, to the point. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something a little bit sad, right? Uh, there was an older pastor who was actually very revered within, I, I forget his name. But um, one day, <clears throat> someone criticized him. Why? Because he was wearing expensive leather shoes. He said, how can a pastor go out and spend this kind of money on leather shoes. What he didn't know was that somebody had donated their old shoes to him and that he had to stuff socks in the front because the shoes didn't fit. But it was his only pair of shoes because his old ones were broken. So someone was like, hey, we saw these shoes and I don't know if you fit this, but maybe you should take it. And so therefore he wore what he had. Didn't spend the dime. Yet people were willing to criticize him and not look at the work that he was doing, but criticize him saying, hey, he's got fancy shoes on. Why is he spending God's money on those things? And you say, oh, that's, that's sad. It's sad, but I would do the same thing if I didn't know the background story, right? I would say, hey, there's a problem here. Why would you do that? Because I make the assumption. And so then we deny God the right to dictate what is going on here. You see, Proverbs chapter 30, when it's talking about this, <coughs> contentment is a fickle thing. Contentment is one where we are comfortable with what God has given us. But the reality is that you're never going to be comfortable with what God has given you unless you have a comfortable relationship with God. Right? Let me, let, let me give you another example. Right? It, it's... It's very unique when, um, when people get into relationships. And for those of you who are married, you know, 15, 20 years, you'll have to maybe think back, right, to, uh, to the days when you're dating. You can get someone from a very wealthy family, girl, beautiful, got all the stuff, and for some reason, she likes that guy who's from a poor family, doesn't have very much, right? And people wonder, like, oh, why are, you, why are you picking up this guy or this girl who doesn't have a lot? And in Asian culture, that's a big deal, right? Your families have to match, like in, in social status. And you say, oh, how could you? But when they're together, man, in love. And then when they go, and I can tell you a story. Pastor Liu comes from a family in Taiwan that wasn't super wealthy, but well enough. The two of them, my mom and my dad, immigrate to the United States. $70 in pocket. Pretty good, not enough to pay tuition. And while they're here, right, <clears throat> they live their life, 
he's a poor PhD student, right? And she is, you know, trying to find jobs at labs or doing like, uh, I remember that uh, back then you could also get hired by uh, clothing companies where they mail you things and you sew it, so small work. And then for each thing that you do, you get like half a penny. So you do a couple hundred, then they, you know, pay you a couple dollars. So my mom used to do that in order to try to make money to make ends meet. But I will tell you that from the stories, man, they were happy. They could have had everything that they wanted. They moved someplace, and this married couple, in poverty, complete joy, complete happiness, content. Both Christians went to church. <coughs> Their days spent were literally spent either my dad doing his PhD program or doing church things, prayer meeting, you know, Bible study, evangelism, driving, you know, uh, other international students who didn't have cars to go get groceries, all sorts of things. And that was the joy in their life in impoverished times. How is it possible for someone to be that poor, yet that happy and content? Because they had purpose. And I, I know I'm bragging about my parents a little bit. But they had purpose. They knew that, hey, it's not about you know, what we make now. It's about what we're doing for God. And so therefore, they spent their time doing that. Very happy. Didn't have time to worry about anything else. They spent so much time doing things for church and the fellowship. Content, right? And as time progressed, <coughs> my dad continued to, like, you know, he was environmental engineering, and he was the guy that, um, that large companies hated because he would tell them, you know, your water runoff is going to pollute the stream, so therefore, no bueno, denied, can't build it, right? So he was that guy, but a lot of companies would try to hire him in order to kind of analyze their, and so then he started, people were giving him more money, right? Hey, come do this project for us. We'll give you X dollars. And so then he made that money. But yet, from living with my dad, I know exactly what would happen. Right? He works hard every day, you know, comes home at 8 p.m. But then on Wednesdays, he's early to prayer meeting. Then on Thursdays, he's, he's early to prepare for Bible study. Then on Fridays, he comes home early in order to go to, go to, uh, go to Friday Night Fellowship. And then on Saturdays, he prepares for Sunday where he has to, you know, either speak or teach Sunday school or whatever it is. Day in and day out. Now, the funny thing is, <coughs> he works hard, so he could miss a couple things, like if I had a baseball game or something. It doesn't matter. But the one thing that we never missed, never was late to, Bible study and prayer meeting. It was terrible for a younger guy like who's like, oh, I can't believe we have to go and listen to people. Mmm, mmm, amen for an hour. Right? It was terrible for someone who's like, you know, like a junior higher or, or in elementary school to do that. But now that I think about it, man, priorities, right? So then even in, with more money, like <coughs> people wonder, well, what did you guys do? We didn't take vacation. A vaca we didn't have a vacation for like 12 years straight. Why? Too busy with church, right? And now uh, you might say, oh, poor Albert, didn't get out, go on a vacation. But now that I think back on it, it's because they understood something was more important. You see, contentment, didn't, it didn't change between when they're impoverished and doing, like, you know, sweatshop work, all the way to, oh, you have enough money to buy a house, and you can go on vacation if you wanted to. It didn't change. Why? Because there's one thing consistent and steady, and that is the person of Christ. So when we read this passage, it says, do not... Um, Remove from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed for me the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say who is the Lord. Lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. <clears throat> you realize that there's a line that says, feed me with the food that is needful for me. It's about capacity. Capacity. Some people have great capacity for a lot of earthly goods and they will not lose sight of God. God bless you if you're that type of person. Some people don't have the capacity, so when they're given so much, they lose sight of God immediately. But there are some people who are okay regardless. For richer or for poor, it doesn't matter. That they remain faithful to God. Needfulness is uh, an interesting topic. Like some of the kids, right, you'll, you'll hear, Mom, Dad. I need this game. Like everybody else, I need it. Needfulness changes <laughs> based upon what you find is your standard, right? <coughs> and you tell them, you don't need it. 
and they say, I do need it. Like my daughter started telling me this, Dad, I want this. I was like, why? She's like, because I need it. I was like, you don't need it, Ellie. You're four. You don't need that. What you need is vegetables and rice and good nutrition and to go to school and to do your homework. You don't need anything else. That's all you need. And I was like, no, no, no. I need. I need it. And so she started doing need. And for those who are younger, man, you tell your parents all day in and day out, I need this. You don't need it. <laughs> now, let's, let's then bring it backward. Uh, bring it forward to us talking to God. Sometimes we tell God, God, I need this. I need this job. I need this to happen. I need all of a sudden. God's telling you, no, no, you don't need it. You can't even handle it, right? If I gave it to you right now, disaster, right? For example, you tell a kid, okay, I will let you eat whatever you want for dinner. You pick. All right, I want Skittles and gummy bears on ice cream. Why? Doesn't know any better. Thinks that stuff is good. They eat it, and then you're with them throughout the night because they've had too much sugar. They get stomach ache. They throw up, and you're just like, I told you. I told you. And if we think about God in the same way as a heavenly father, many times when we're talking about need, we need to stop lying to ourselves. We need to pray before God so that God can tell us, hey, this is what you need so that everything else will fall away. Everything else will fall away. I mean, uh, just to end with a little bit of stats, like, you know what the number one thing that uh, couples fight about? Number one thing, money. That is what they fight about. And, and, and it's interesting because I see a lot of people in different stages of their relationship, right? And especially in the early stages when you don't really know each other. Like, uh, just recently I, I, I encountered a couple, and this couple uh, got into an argument. Our argument was interesting, right? This, the girl had gone out and bought a pair of shoes for the guy. Expensive pair of shoes. The guy, and they're not married yet, super frugal, said, why did you spend this kind of money? You didn't even go and get the coupon. There's a coupon for 15% off. You didn't even bother to get a coupon. And, he, and the girl's sitting there like, I was trying to do something nice for you. And you're going to tell me that I should have cut out a coupon. You get mad at me for spending this money. And they got into an argument, right? Money. And then you look at couples that are older, who've been around the block, right? All of a sudden, the husband gets to a point, ah, you my not my lot. Who cares? Just don't bother me, please. You just get it. Just get it. Right? And, and, and you, you look at couples that stick together, and you realize when they're younger, money and things are so important. And then all of a sudden, when they're older, happiness is more important. Right? Contentment is more important. They say this. Happy wife, happy life, right? That's what they say. And there's some wisdom to that. Of course, it's not fully biblical, okay? Don't go off and just spend your every single paycheck on, like, you know, extraneous goods. We know that you're not going to do that. I know that you're not going to do that. But the reason why these couples stay together is not because they somehow came to a compromise as to how to spend it. No, it's because they love each other. If the core of the marriage is God and love for one another, everything else kind of will slip to the side. That is what it means to be content, right? If you walk into life thinking that it's a, tr if you walk into marriage, and for those who are married a long time, you did not walk into marriage saying, okay, well, let's do our 50-50, okay? I'll do the laundry, you have to do the dishes. If I make a dollar, I give you 50 cents. If you make a dollar, you give me 50 cents. If I get a bonus, you get half of it, but we keep everything separate and calculate it straight down the middle, 50-50. You think that'll work? Of course not. No way. Right? You know no way that's going to work. What happens is that the best marriages are when both sides go 100% in the other direction. Right? They, one person does the best that they can for their spouse. And the other person does the same. And sometimes they don't connect. But because that, <coughs> that love exists, that they have a constant relationship that understands that everything else is separate, and that becomes steady marriage that goes on for 60, 70 years. Same thing with our relationship with God. When you talk about contentment and you talk about our relationship with God, can we really tell him, give me neither poverty nor riches? Man, if it was me, I'd be like, God, give me poverty, uh, give me riches, please. Like, if you could, right? I would love to say that to God. 
But give me neither poverty or riches so that what? Because the focus is so that I do not deny you or I do not profane your name and humiliate your name. Why? Because the relationship with God is what is most important. If that becomes steady, then contentment will naturally follow. Because neither riches nor wealth will cause you to stray away from God. When he gives you a lot, you give it right back to him. If he takes it away from you, you say, everything I had is the Lord's. Right? And that is the way that you become content. But the problem? The problem arises when we do things like compare ourselves to others around us. You see, the relationship with God means that I know what God is trying to tell me and how God wants me to live my life. The moment that I say that God has told me how I, he wants you to live your life, it starts changing things, right? I look at someone else, I say, oh, how come they have so much? God, what the heck, right? I do so much more. Why do I not have more? Because that's not what the relationship's about. You've completely misunderstood your relationship with God in that case. And so, brothers and sisters, I hope that while you read Proverbs, when you think about the books of wisdom, when you think about what it means to be a content believer, you realize that it has very little to do with the physical things that you've grasped in this world, but rather has to do with what your relationship is like with God. Are you able to worship and serve God if everything was taken away? Are you able to worship and not forget God if everything's given to you? You see, that's what we strive for as believers, to be completely steady regardless of what happens around us. I mean, how many, how many things have gone wrong when, you know, like, you lose your 401k in a 2008 crash, right? All of a sudden, you're stressed out. It's like, God, why? Why are you doing this? If that's the case, man, we got to start praying and understanding what our relationship with God is like. Because honestly, not to sound pessimistic, <coughs> God does not promise us a smooth life when we are believers. For those who are, have been Christians a long time, you understand this. What God promises you is that he will be with you every step of the way and that you have gained eternity. But this life, the one thing that's guaranteed is if you're doing things right, you will be persecuted. Mm. Not a great selling point for, for Christianity, right? Hey, by the way, would you like to believe in our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ? Because when you do, you get persecuted. That's not a great way to, to sell Christianity. But that is what God promises. But he promises something far greater. He says, hey, but when you come to faith in me, you will not lose your life and you will gain eternity that this life is just a very little bit right now. And if we can all understand that, then just maybe we can be a little more immune to the things that social media feeds us. We can be a little more immune to the jealousy that, that creeps up when we see someone else succeeding. We can be a little bit more immune when something bad happens and we ask God why. <coughs> and with that, let us pray. Dear God, we want to thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that you would truly allow us to uh, uh, desire neither riches nor poverty, Lord God, but to really understand, Lord, what you have called us to do. God, I pray that you would keep us content, that you allow us to be completely content in your love and your grace and your mercy, God. May we never forget that, whether you bless us with many things in this life or that we are suffering on, on things of this world, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you continually... Uh, watch and protect your bro uh, the brothers and sisters in the church, Lord God. May you lift them up, Lord God, so that they would continually give you thanks in all things. God, I pray that because we are human, Lord God, that so many times we sin against you by just um, by our pride or our desire for more worldly things, Lord God. And we pray that you remove that so that you would cleanse us, Lord God, to be holy and righteous before you, that we would be more and more like Christ each and every single day. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Proudly singing in Jesus' name.